All right, with that, let's uh, get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Keishan Koster. I'm a Java developer. Well, since grown into management, so I'm not sure if I can call myself a, a developer anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm now this guy in the picture and not that guy. I'll uh, leave you guys to find that picture for yourself. We've got this printed out and hung uh, over the heads of the developers. Um, I married two kids. I live in Delft in Holland uh, and I currently work for Visions Connected. I'm a freelancer, so I work everywhere. Uh, and this uh, is the second of three presentations. So I'm going to be talking about personal productivity and about distraction-free programming for you guys. Hopefully you find it useful. And uh, later this afternoon, I'll talk about bimodal architectures as well. So combining uh, what used to be called leg legacy, but we have a new name for it, uh, with uh, what used to be called agile, but we have a new name for it. So um, with that, I want to take you guys into time to code. Who here? Uh, Quick quiz, who here has trouble focusing on the work they should be doing, right? And it's a bit of a trick question because you probably wouldn't be in this room if you didn't have that problem, right? Tip number one, don't go to conferences. Saves you a lot of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the stuff that gets between you and coding, right? The ideal picture is you come in in the morning at work, you check JIRA, there's a task list, and you just cross them off one by one. And in the afternoon, you have lunch, you go home, done deal, right? No nothing except maybe a few scrum meetings. So what gets in the way of this? It's meetings, obviously, right? What can, do, can we do about meetings uh, to make them more efficient? Questions. I don't know about you guys, but uh, my team gets asked a lot of questions. Um, and there's this feeling of, you know, when you're working, that you're, uh, I've got it now, actually, because I have and production incidents running at the kind in Holland. I've, uh, you know, I've got people contacting me about job interviews, and I have to do this presentation, and, you know, it adds up. Uh, my, my daughter's birthday is tomorrow, so I have to make sure the car is in the right place for after the birthday. We take the, the girl, she's seven, she's going to be seven, so take the girls home. <sighs> ah. And then there is procrastination. Facebook, I'm looking at you, right? I'm not actually going to talk about procrastination because I didn't get it done in time. So I'm going to be using a few of the so-called solutions, things that uh, people apply to themselves, to their team, to their company uh, that are supposed to help, right? Give focus and allow you uh, to have time to code. And I picked these not because they're the best or the worst, but these are things that I apply a lot and uh, because they are a nice mix of things. At the top, there's getting things done, which is not necessarily a coding uh, way of working, but it is a way of getting yourself unstuck. It is a way of organizing your personal life so that you, you, know, you can and take the trash out and do your work and know when your wife's birthday is, etc. Who here knows getting things done? Okay, I'll take a little bit more time explaining later. And it's, uh, I find it very helpful, but that may just be me. Scrum, who here knows Scrum? All right, who here knows Prince 2? All right, sorry for you. Uh, Prince 2, for those who don't know, is a project management uh, thing, and it's you know, for a bigger product. This is waterfall defined, essentially. And the uh, human interaction protocol, in essence, that's the thing that I, that I came up with. It's a collection of ideas that I learned over the time from uh, personal activity training. So I'll be taking bits and bobs of that and using them in this presentation as well. All right, let's go into these things real quick. This is a picture, if you're doing getting things done, don't worry about the picture because I know you guys are a bit far away to see it. Um, in essence, what does go, uh, getting things done do? First thing is that inbox, right? As a person, you strive, you, you'll never reach that goal, but you'll strive to have one inbox. Everything goes in there. Your work, your mail, your phone calls, your SMS messages, everything, email, it all goes to, into one big conceptual inbox, right? Not 18, not and Twitter and Facebook, no, just one thing. And then all of these things you put in a big pile and you just go through them one by one. I mean, you've got two hands. So you don't do four or five things at the same time. Pick one up, look at it, what is it? Is this something I can do in two minutes? Do it. 
If it's something that I need to plan, plan it. If it's bigger, put it on a separate pile to get to later, right? And this is something that can help you get unstuck if you've got too many little things going on in life. It really helps for coding as well because, you know, all of your work goes into one inbox called Jira, and then you just pick up one item and all the rest you can forget about because you'll get to it. You know, you've got two hands. This is how much time you can spend on it. You can forget about the world until you're done, theoretically. Scrum, I don't need to talk to you guys about Scrum. Don't worry, I'll, I won't. Prince 2, uh, you can tell by the, by the um, style of diagram also. This is for projects that run two, three years, right? This is not your uh, two-month delivery or two-week sprint. or th That's not what Prince 2 is for. Prince 2 is for project managers who man manage budgets of millions, right? And they cut up that budget, they cut up the time, they cut up the task in a specified way, and they have all these deliverables and reports and things, and it gives, you, gives them a structure to work in, right? Because if you're doing a project of two years, you don't want to reinvent the wheel while you're trying to drive. So this gives project management and management a very good structure to structure a big project, project and to track progress and to be able to steer the mammoth that you're driving. And one of the things that I like about, that's also why I chose these things, why, what I like about these three is that they fit together. So if you look at directing a project, ultimately it breaks down to a product delivery. And the product delivery inside Prince2 can be done using Scrum. So your sprints have a place. And inside Scrum, when you're doing Scrum on the floor every day, you can use getting things done to organize your day and make sure you don't get overwhelmed. Right? So in scale, these three fit together really, really well. And each of them can be replaced by something else. So don't take it from me. Try to find what fits for you. Uh, but be aware of these three scales. Company scale, team scale, personal scale. And make sure you have a methodology on each level. Who here has meetings? Another trick question. We're having one right now, in fact. So, you know, you're sitting at that meeting and you're going, why am I here? You know, there's one guy who doesn't listen to anyone. He's just talking for himself. There's one guy who never listens to anything. He's just on his phone doing stuff. You know, your manager is typing emails at, what is this place? Why am I here? Why am I spending time on this? Um, what I try to do with my team, I ask of people and uh, I try to do, is to define the meeting when you start it. In fact, when you send out an invitation, at that point, this is a good, a good moment to think, maybe three minutes, right? Don't take too much time, but three minutes. And you're going to say, what is the purpose of this meeting? What if you would start your invitation with one of these three sentences? And I'm sure you can come up with more. But the purpose of these is to give structure to the invitation so that the other person knows why they should waste their time in your meeting. Right? You will walk away with, right? What I literally did for the, the, the abstract for this talk is I wrote down, you will walk away with. Those were the first words ever written for the abstract. And then from there, I tried to make it into a sentence. It forces me to define what you guys are going to learn when you walk out the door, right? There are 25 people in this room, 100 euro each, 2,500 euro, right? One hour. That's the cost I have to recover just by standing here, right? That's my challenge, okay? So you walk away with 100 euro worth of knowledge. That's my objective for each of you, okay? You will, we will decide, uh, obviously we won't decide anything here, but in a meeting, maybe it's not a meeting for you guys, it's a meeting for me. I need to know, are we going left or right? You know, is it gonna be a five or camp? Is it going to be virtual hardware? We will decide this and that. And then each of the participants can say, all right, I'm, I'm part of that decision, or look, I don't care either way. I'm, I'm going to you know, decline. Sorry, guys, you decide. I trust you'll take the right decision. And sometimes all your contribution is 
putting knowledge on the table, right? You have to contribute this and that. You have to explain how a load balancer works. You have to explain to management why that prediction incident happened, right? So that is your contribution to the meeting. Try what works for you, but if you pick one of these sentences or one of your own and you start your meeting request with that, it gives a very clear focus. And maybe you won't even schedule the meeting because you don't, if you can't answer this, why meet? I mean, what's the purpose? Why waste the time? Now, if you're going to a meeting or if there's someone in the meeting and they cannot contribute in any way, contribute, I mean, also by gaining knowledge, right? That person or you should get up and leave. I mean, why are you there? Your purpose is not to keep the seat warm, right? There are several companies where we started doing this. This is not something that is uh, something you can start on your own, right? This is a, a team agreement, a company agreement. Some meetings are there because, you know, for the better purpose of that person. So you can't just get up and leave because they will be offended. It's also culturally different. In Holland, you can probably say, look, I'm not doing anything, I'm going to leave. Whereas in Germany or France, probably, you know, someone is going to take offense. I say this as a Dutch person. I don't know much about that part. So even in a company where we did this, we sat down and we said, all right, as of now, if somebody is in a meeting that they're not contributing to in any way, they get up and leave, right? They apologize, say, look, ask final question. Is there anything I can do? And then you go off. So the first time it actually happened, someone got up and said, look, I'm, I don't think I'm contributing. Uh, is it okay if I leave? And it's very funny because I instituted the rule and I was still if offended. I was like, wait, this is my meeting. You're supposed to be here. That's the feeling I got, right? So this is how deep uh, meeting ethic, if you will, is inside even me. And I, I'm a big proponent of this rule. So I stepped over for myself and said, yeah, you know, okay, please leave. And I thought in myself, okay, so this means for me, that I didn't meet, make the meeting clear, right? The purpose of the meeting. Or I didn't keep the people on the purpose of the meeting. We were doing something else. And that made him feel like leaving, right? So it's a, and it comes here as well. I mean, you guys are sitting here. As soon as you feel that the information is not, it's not worth the 100 euro that I promised earlier, by all means, get up and leave, all right? Don't worry. And I won't feel offended. It's, it has happened. <laughs> <laughs> I know now I will no longer feel offended. <laughs> All right, so if you cannot contribute, you leave. I mean, it's an hour of your time. You can spend that hour coding everybody else's meeting. Yeah, you're the only one at your desk. That's a pretty cool time, I can tell you that. So I don't know about you guys, don't worry about the picture too much, but I've got, I'm, you know, m when I eat, there's a very distinct time in which I'm productive after that, before I need to eat. You know, when I walk in the, in the city with my wife and I say, I need to eat, she knows we can do everything else, but we need to eat first, right? When Kejan says we need to eat, we better do it or I'll be grumpy. So what happens in my body is that there's the, my blood sugar, blood sugar levels, you know, they drop off really quickly when I get hungry, when I'm out of my uh, dinner zone, if you will. And everybody has this in some form. Some people have it more extreme than others. I'm, I can see it in my kids, so I, I'm afraid I pass this on in some form uh, to them. Um, but I'm most productive in the morning, right? I can focus better. I can make better decisions in the morning. So when I try to code, I do it in the mornings because that is when I'm productive. And after 10 at night, for some reason. Don't ask me why. But my nights between 10 and midnight are pretty productive as well. That's my coding time. What I notice in the team that I'm in now is that everybody concurs that, that uh, those are good coding times. How about we plan the meetings in the afternoons, just after lunch when everybody's drowsy anyway, right? Because at that point, we, we won't be doing any proper coding anyway. So we might as well meet. Right, so our planning, our scrum planning meeting actually starts after lunch on Tuesday, every Tuesday. So talk to your team about this. Talk to your team about, all right, talk to your management, talk to people around you about it. Say, look, these are the times that are precious to us for coding. 
and don't interrupt us then, but we'll be happy to do meetings afterwards, right? We only meet in the afternoon. If you work with an international company, I've worked from Holland with American uh, people, you know, you have sort of this, this natural overlap. Don't try to code in the overlap, right? Uh, guilty as charged, I mean, it won't work. Yeah, use the overlap for meetings, and then each has a predefined slot for coding and for meeting. And in a sense, Scrum gives us this, right? You have the Scrum ceremony, and it's all set. You can plan it weeks ahead. Do it, you know, and talk to your team about which are the good times of the day for coding and which are the good times for Scrum ceremony. What is the time that is most effective for us to have a stand-up? In our team, it's 10 because we are sure that everybody is in, but it's not the point where everybody's busy yet, right? It's fairly late in the day. I'm used to having it. Uh, 9.39. Other teams have a scrum at, uh, just before lunch because it is a way to keep the stand-up short, right? Because the stand-up is in the way before you and lunch, so you better be brief. And again, the planning meetings and the, the um, uh, uh, retrospective and the backlog grooming sessions, they can all be planned weeks ahead and put in slots where you know that people aren't productive anyway. Action points. Yes, sir. So does that mean that, uh, I mean, does the meeting then get, uh, I mean, the quality of the meeting, does that lag behind when you are in a non-productive uh, Right. <laughs> okay. So you're saying that the, the quality of the meeting might suffer because you put it in a day, in a slot of the day that everybody's drowsy. Uh, in a sense, yes. Um, but, um, uh, I would say if you're sitting behind your desk trying to focus on code, right, uh, or if you're 15 people in a room and you can say, oh, you know, I'm a bit drowsy, yeah, I'm drowsy too, or you, you, can, you can help each other get out of that more. Where if you're on your own behind your desk, you know, you're going to sink all the way, if you will, right, unless you go and talk to someone else, which interrupts yourself and the person around you. So yes, but it's deliberate. Is that, is that a good answer? Okay. Uh, on the topic of answers, uh, please interrupt me with your question, right? Just raise your hand, shout out. Um, I usually run out of time at the end, so there might not be time for your question, right? So ask. So when you're doing a meeting, people get action points, right? Oh, I'll fix that. Okay, you'll fix that. Good. How do you track action points? Typically, you have meeting notes. Right, there will be a Word document which goes on to a forgotten window share and nobody with a Mac can actually access. And then at the, end, at the beginning of the next meeting, there will be this Word document. Everybody goes, oh, wait, what was my action point? You know? How about you put your action points in JIRA, there and then? You know, oh, I'm going to fix that. All right, put a zero-hour thing on the ticket tracker so that next morning you're reminded by your team, hey, guys, you're supposed to do this. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, I was, right? This ensures that the point actually gets done. Now, why does that work? There's this thing called getting things done. And I said earlier, you strive in getting things done for that one inbox. One inbox, not two, not five, not a million, right? So you take, for example, Jira. I use Jira, not to say Jira is good or bad, right? That's, that, this happens to be the ticket tracker I use the most, so I use it as an example. So what if your only inbox, what if all your work came from Jira? Wouldn't that be cool? Because you wouldn't have to check your mail. Nobody would come and ask questions. There would be no other ticketing systems. All you do is look at Jira, take the top one off the backlog for you or off the, the sprint log for you, and just do it, right? And forget about the whole world. How cool is that? You can help that by putting things on that one backlog. And what it does, that's the theory behind getting things done. By putting everything in one predictable backlog or one predictable inbox, you actually limit um, the nerves that you get from, oh, I should check there, oh, I should check there. When I came into the team that I'm in now, they had like 15 different chat clients open because support would use this one, and the other guys would use that one, and management would use this one, and then there's customers using that one. And there'd be, you know, beeping things on their screens. And one of the things I said is just close them all off. 
right? That you don't have to respond to customers because we, we've got pre-sales guys who do that and support people, right? There are 18 people in this company who, support, who should talk to customers. Why does development talk to customers? Why do they have the extra inbox in Skype? No need, right? Why does support use and a ticketing system and a chat client to talk to developers? That's not necessary. Use the ticket tracker only. One inbox. And that just quiets down your day because you don't have so much input, so many things coming at you. All right. Before I switch, any, any more questions about topics? Uh, about topics, hear me. Uh, about meetings. OK? Questions. And in this case, I mean the questions that interrupt you, right? That keep you off your work because somebody's at your desk going, hey, about that email. When I came into the team, I described earlier, I mean, these guys had a person next to their desk more than half the time. Try coding. When you have a person talking to you about different co su t subjects than your code, half the time. So let's talk a bit about questions, and let's talk about the things that we did and that you might do and that maybe will help you reduce that volume. Who here is interrupted by questions regularly, right? OK, so this is a good topic. Why is a question so problematic for a developer, right? We all know this. This picture, the URL is here. You can, you can get the slides afterwards. Um, so this picture actually tells it. In essence, what it says, you look at a little coding problem, and in your head, you build a mental model of your code, right? But not only that, you've got the model of your code as it is today. You've got a model of what it needs to be, and you're sorting out the differences between the two, right? You're juggling plates, probably five or six of them. And then the manager, by now it's me, uh, with a mug, you know, team mug coming in and mugs you quite literally, and he says, "All oh, right, that email that I wrote you ten minutes ago, you know, have you read it?" Well, no, I'm juggling. Okay, so and then he talks to you to the point where all the plates are on the floor, and when he leaves, and this is two minutes after, that mental model is gone, and you're rebuilding it, probably poorly, right? There's one thing you've forgotten. And that results in what we all call a bug. So what can we do with questions? Well, the first thing you can do is anticipate. Let's talk about Prince2 for a bit, right? So this, um, if I'm nasty about it, is a way for project managers to keep each other busy. What they've got is report, 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 report. If you work in a larger company, you'll know this. They'll just, you know, this Thursday morning guy comes in, right? He comes there every Thursday morning. He has these questions about status, and he wants to know all kinds of stuff. And then he goes away, and then next week he's back. Who is that? You know, why is he there? Well, probably he's working on his checkpoint reports. And he has to hand them in on Thursday afternoon before lunch, or just after lunch, you know, depending. So he's like, oh, crap, I have to interrupt development. So whoop, he goes to development, asks his questions, gets his information, and leaves. He's there every Thursday morning. If you know that checkpoint reports are due Thursdays, you know that he's going to interrupt you. Right? Don't, don't be surprised about it. These things, if you work in a larger company, are predefined. You can go ask any project manager, and they'll tell you each report, who has to give input, and who will be interrupted by it. What well, a last step you have to do. So go find out. Right? Don't let yourself be surprised about it. I'll take a sidestep now. This is called situational leadership. Who here knows this model? OK, that's not surprising. This is a, a, a model that describes how managers and uh, team members interact. Right? And I'll give a bit of a background. So for a given task, you have a certain maturity level, rated right M1 to M4. Right? M1 being, for example, in Java, I've heard of the name, but I don't know how to code. Right? I've probably done JavaScript, but apart from four letters from the name, I don't know anything about Java. M4 being probably many of you guys and many of the speakers here, you can give them a coding problem, and they come up with a solution. Right? 
You'll throw a coding problem in that direction and you'll get either a question for more information or the solution. That's M4. So M1 is when you're insecure, you don't know anything about it. M2, you've grown a bit. M3, M4 is you can be completely independent about this. Right? And this is true for you know, knowing where the coffee machine is. If you're first coming in, I, I, I contract a lot, so I come into companies new a lot. Um, where's the coffee machine? Where's the toilet? And then, as a manager, you have to have different ways of dealing with this, right? If somebody doesn't know something, you have to be directive, you have to be clear. Christian did that on the first day. He comes in, says, welcome to JDK.io, this is where the toilets are, this is about coffee, this is about lunch. Completely directive, you know, very clear, and everybody who didn't know that felt good about it, because, oh, okay, now I know where the toilets are, I know where to find coffee, and I know how lunch works. And that feels good. Right? I don't like to be micromanaged, but I was really happy Christian was doing it to me at that point in time. On the other hand, after five JDK IOs that all look the same, you know, if he still does that, you're like, yeah, I know. You know, if you've told me four years before, I know this. Thank you. So situational leadership is for management, but also for yourself in a way to look at the communication that's happening and seeing why you feel uneasy about it, right? Maybe you're at your desk and there's this manager again and he's telling you how to do your work again, right? This is probably an indication that you, in skill level, may be on the left side of this picture, whereas he is treating you as if you were on the right side. He's being directive when he should be supportive to you, right? He should delegate to you rather than direct you, rather than steer you. That may be something you want to talk about if you have that feeling. Or maybe you're sitting behind your desk going, okay, so, so what now? You know, um, I've got this assignment that's gobbledygook and nobody knows anything, so now what, right? That probably means that you are being treated as if you can be delegated to, but you don't have the skills yet. You need some direction, right? And certainly a lot of support. So where am I going with this? If you are, um, if you have grown into the company to a certain level, you go from you have to report, right? You're surprised by being, oh, oh, I need to give status updates. Well, this is where we stand, I think. Um, to where you take the initiative, you know, you walk in, 8 o'clock Thursday morning, you go to the office of the Thursday morning guy, you put a report on his table and he says, do you have any more questions? And his jaw just drops on the floor. How cool is that? Yeah? You anticipate the questions, and not only that, you act to it, and you go take the step, and then you're not interrupted because you're in control. You're deciding when that information is transferred. In fact, you're deciding how it's transferred because you don't want to talk about it. You give them a copy of JIRA and say, this and this are the tickets that are closed. Any more questions? Yeah? So, in, in communication, you also go from M1, oh, oh, is this the way we do it here, to M4, look, Mr. Manager, I gave you the report this morning. If it's not clear, then you can know where to find me. Limiting input channels. So, phone. There's the little tab, right? I keep my phone squeaky clean. To give you an idea, uh, there's this, this start screen, as you can see there's some messages. SMS messages, Spark messages, they can come on to the first screen of my phone. But games have no business playing sounds, showing badges or text here, no way. Right? So I do have games on the phone, but they have no privileges on my phone other than to be there and I can go to them if I want to. But they're not interrupting me ever. Not even visually, right? You may think it's not a distraction, but you know it really is. Likewise, so if you look at my communication, you know, I have uh, sort of levels in there. If it's uh, IO, which is another chat client, nobody uses it. So I, I don't give it privileges. Skype, nobody uses it. Okay, no privileges. So I limit the number of channels to my phone. My email is allowed to show badges, and there's one game that my son really likes that is allowed to show a little badge. All the other applications are silent and dormant until I ask them to. So I keep control of the input channels through my phone. 
that way. This little tab makes it silent and it's on almost 90% of the time. During lunch, I may have it on. Much to the chagrin of my wife, I can tell you, but you know, that's the price. So do this. You know, you're not a victim of the interruptions you're getting. You are choosing not to push back the channel. You know, we're talking about Netty and there was pushback. Okay, do the same in real life. Okay? What can help is that you make this quadrant and you look during a day where things live. One of the most important things to do, and also the most difficult, is to separate important things and urgent things. Importance and urgence are not the same, although they are treated interchangeably. They're not. Important things are uh, technical depth that needs to be done. Right? It's a beautiful example. Important things are my wife calling because one of the kids is sick. Important things are school calling. That's usually important. They don't call often. Urgent things are things that have to happen now, 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 right? This room on fire. Let's leave. You know, there's no, it's not about important or not, it's we have to move now. Not urgent is, uh, you know, there's some trash there in the, in the side. Okay, fine. You know, doesn't feel urgent. What's happening in many companies, and uh, one uh, I have to add in the company that I'm in now, is that people deliberately confuse this. So people will come to me and it's really urgent and it has to happen now, now, now. When it's really not urgent and it's maybe not as important. Maybe important or not urgent, right? But it's important to them, so they make it urgent as well in the hope that you start doing it. So as a person, you can plot things here, right? Games live here. They're by definition not urgent and not important. They make themselves urgent with sound, with badges, with everything, right? Facebook does the same thing. Oh, there's a new message. Oh, there's a new message. You'll know it's crap, but you look anyway. You know, it's here. All the social media, they're here. Unimportant. Don't allow them to become urgent, right? Because that distracts your mind. Urgent and important are stuff that has to happen now. And this is the problematic stuff because, yes, it has to happen now, but it's also happening under pressure. Production incidents, they belong here. What you should do, and don't take it from me, Stephen Covey, the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, says, from where this model came from, uh, says you work on stuff that's not urgent, but is important. Right? So every day, try to do something that isn't urgent and is important. Fix one bug, do one fix me in your code, you know, do one extra code review. Do, do something that's important and not urgent. And I have to do this explicitly. I mean, everybody comes to me as the manager of that team saying, oh, everything is urgent and important. You have to do it. No, 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 no. And I literally have to say to people, look, you know, for you it's urgent, for you it's important, but I'm doing something else, right? I'm going to write the documentation and then fix your production incident because otherwise we'll have this very same conversation three days from now. Do you want that? And it's not a message people like. I mean, you know, I do get yelled at for that. But the advantage is that I have my documentation next time and I can say, look, why are you coming for me to me when your team has all the documentation to fix this all by themselves? Right? By taking a little bit of time, even under pressure, to do this, this slows down and goes away. And by clearing this, your head becomes clearer for this and this, uh, this and this. And this, over time, should be ignored. You can do it to pass the time if you're bored or if you just need something to pass the time. Scrum also does the same thing, yeah? It says, you know, everything comes down to the Scrum Master. Everybody, project manager, product owners, the whole thing just bombs down on the Scrum Master or nobody else. Yeah? Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah? Don't interrupt anyone, just that guy. It's his life. Sorry, mate. Sorry, mate. You know. Communicate availability. That is what the daily scrum is for. I tell people, you're welcome to interrupt my team between 10 and quarter past 10 every day. You know, you can ask anything. You can ask about the color of the car. I mean, I, do, I really don't care. But that is the time to interrupt us because we're talking about progress and status anyway. 
So that is the time when you can come in. Please don't come in at other times, right? Unless there's a really, really something going on. And even then you shouldn't. So Scrum helps you with this, but it needs to be clear to everybody when you're doing it and that you don't want to be interrupted when you're not doing it. And it's not a nice message. People will not like you for saying it, but you're going to have to say, not now, there's a Scrum in 10 minutes. Yes, sir. So uh, what we do is we have a rotating Scrum Master on a team I'm, uh, because I'm managing this team and another team, right? So I'm trying to get them to the point, uh, plus I'm temporary, right? I'm, I'm interim anyway. So three months from now, I'm back on the street and they're still doing it, right? So there's a Scrum Master on the team and that person can be interrupted, yeah? We call it point man, but the Scrum Master role didn't, doesn't strike a bell with anyone, so we call it point man. Now that point man is interrupted for everything. He literally has a Lego man on his desk that somebody made, don't ask. Um, and you know, okay, that guy I can interrupt, right? You communicate who can and cannot be interrupted. Does that answer your question? I did it when I came in, but I, I because I'm temporary, I put the role on, uh, on a rotating role. This is the universe. These are really nice cans, by the way. I've got, I own a pair. Nice stuff. So this is the universal sign that a developer doesn't want to be interrupted, right? Don't abuse it. Don't have them on your head all the time. But when you're coding, when you're quietly coding, this is what you put on. You don't have to put music on, don't worry. Find music with no text in it, for example. So you can focus, you know, you have the background music, but you can. So this is the sign, and in many companies I've worked, if you're wearing cans, you're not being interrupted. That is the rule. Rotate the hat is essentially the, the, uh, my answer to the question. Um, not sure what I wanted with this. Oh, yeah, it's this. So um, in this model that I talked to you about, uh, about before, there's something really interesting. If as a manager, as a team lead, I behave directively right, to everybody, I'm, I'm seeing this in the company I'm in now. So if I'm always directive, the effect on the person I'm talking to is that they'll grant me that podium and they say, okay, you're the big boss, you arrange everything, right? So they lean back figuratively. They think, oh, it's a f you know, he'll do it for me, that's fine. So directive behavior invites people to be passive and to wait for the next direction from me. So I saw this quite literally. There's a one guy who's with the company quite long and he knows everything about the system, right? And he is a bit fed up with answering questions about the code, but everybody goes to him because he's the guy who knows most. I don't know if you guys see this, but there's new guys are coming in and they end up, you know, keeping the old guys from that work. And in this case, it was three to one. So there's three here and one there. That guy didn't do any coding. Right? And he, with all respect to the other guys, was my best coder. So why, why does he keep interrupted so much? And it took me a long time to realize that because he was answering the questions wrong, what he was doing, he was being directive. He said, look, all right, so open this file, look there, look there. See this, those lines, that's where the problem is. Okay. I'm not even sure what I'm hearing. Um, and the other guys, you know, they're fed up actually too because they, for even simple things, they have to go to that old guy all the time, right? They, there's nothing they can do independently. So they're frustrated, he's frustrated. So we made a rule for him. He said, we said, you're only allowed to tell the question asker which file to read, right? No lines of code, no nothing. You tell him what file to look at. And everything else, they have to do themselves, right? So you're not allowed to answer questions. You're allowed to point in the general direction of the solution. And that helped because, you know, these guys needed support. He, what he was doing, he was keeping everybody here by his directive, by his precise answering of questions. And by letting go 
and saying, all right, you have to read that file and then you probably understand, suddenly the newer guys were forced in a situation where they had to learn the whole code base, which they were kind of not, they were getting away with not doing. And he was put in a position where after two seconds he was done with the question. Back to coding. So that really helped. All right, so if you're going on an airplane, you're trying to cram 500 people into an airplane, uh, you know, stuff goes wrong. What they do in an airplane is that they separate you into priority access, general boarding. Uh, you can see in supermarkets as well, we have a supermarket called Plus, and when you go there, they have all these, you know, normal lines, and they have this, you know, basket checkout line where you can go if you have less than 10 things. So what that tells us is that there, what it tells me, is that there is a need for something, you know, when you just have a small question, when there's just a small thing you want done, you know, you, you, you just want to be helped. You don't want to be in one of the big queues, right? Because you know it'll take weeks. And people will like to be helpful too. So what we've done in the team is just this. The Scrum Master Point Man role that we have means that you're interrupted with all the questions and it also means you can answer the question, you can help people. So the quick questions get answered there and then on the spot. I had a team that was interrupted all day, every day, right? All of them. And the good thing about that for all the bad things you can think of is that I have a team that's really good at helping the organization, right? Ultimately, everybody felt development was helpful and would always fix the things, even production incidents. And that, at the end of the day, is a good thing, right? So how do we pre preserve that while at the same time allow people to do their work? Well, we did this, right? You can interrupt the Scrum Master. He'll help you to the best of his knowledge. Maybe he'll tell this is a big question, so you need to plan it, okay? But he's the only person who's interrupted, so the team can be helpful and can answer questions quickly and at the same time focus on code. The other guys are focusing on code. Yeah, this alone was the biggest change I've done to the team, the most effective change. Because suddenly you've got two guys coding, two more guys external coding, and one guy answering questions instead of five guys going, oh. You know they will be able to see the video, right? They know. It's not the first time I'm telling this time. All right, and the final one is teach, don't answer. Um, I'll give you uh, a bit of background. So we, as development, are fourth line in support, right? So you've got first line support answers the questions. Second line helps them if it's difficult. Sysadmins help them if, you know, they get stuck. And development helps them if they get stuck. And obviously, if it, you know, sysadmins have their specialities and developers have theirs. This is more application-wise. This is more infrastructure video-wise. Right, so this is the ideal picture, and this is the breadth of all the problems that you can think of, and this is how much a given team has the skills to answer, right? So support only knows smaller problems that are in the middle. Second line knows a bit more because they've been around more, but they still lack all the skills that developers and sysadmins have together. Now this is the theory, but when I look on the workflow, and I look at what people are doing and the type of questions that are being asked, it's clear that first-line support isn't answering the questions they could answer by far. Really trivial questions are passed on and they make it all the way to development. And not only that, they answer the question as development, because that's what they do, and then two days later, some other dude will interrupt some other person and answer the same question, right? So this person here, we'll have a question on this person here too. What is happening here? So what we set about was building up a knowledge base, right? What's the purpose of a knowledge base? A knowledge base teaches ultimately first line support, second line support about how the system works and how to solve certain problems. And this is not a manual. But we have a manual, we're done documenting. No, we're not because the manual explains the general workings of the system, but when you're on the phone and you've got a yelling customer, you just want to know the four mouse clicks that'll fix the problem for that customer. 
You don't care how the system works, right? If it says click the rat, you'll click the rat. So what we've done, we instituted next to this a knowledge base that all these teams share and have read and write access to. And we don't have silly segregations, who can see what, and that's, that's all a waste of time. And what we do now, and this is not successful in the sense it doesn't happen often enough, but the idea is that development and sysadmin can answer questions via the knowledge base. So first liner fails to answer the question, asks for second liner, fails to answer the question. Development answers the question as they do, teaches second line, which then can handle bigger problems and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they can help first line do bigger and bigger problems. That's the theory. So what does that do? That means A, first and second liners get more skills and they grow and they are able to help customers more often, which feels good for them, which is their job, right? You're helping them not fix the problem, you're helping them do their job better. That's different. These people are happier because they can answer more complex questions. These people are happier because they don't have to answer as many questions and not as silly a question. Okay? All right, I'm a bit lost for time, so the general overwhelmed feeling is setting in. Um, what I'll do is I'll keep talking until either someone interrupts me about time or the slides up. And I can see coughing being carried in, so... Uh, so, when you're in that stage, when you're sitting behind your desk going, ah, oh, I can't code because you can't code because, you know, there's so much stuff going on. I usually get it myself when there's too many things that I could do, right? If you're stuck waiting for everyone, I'm not overwhelmed because I'm waiting for everyone. But if there are 15 things that I could do right now, I can't choose. You know, if I was the donkey between a haystack and a banana, I would die. So, what do you do? Right? And essentially, this is a wrap-up of everything we've talked about, but you strive for the one and only one to-do list. Right? I literally switch off my phone to force people to email me so it's one less inbox to worry about. Right? I close off, I close myself off to the other inboxes that you generally have. Uh, in the company, that's even easier because, you know, developers take their work from Jira, so if it's not in Jira, you don't work on it. Why are you replying to email? You know, it's as simple as that. You're in a team, right? You're not alone. D don't sit there going, ah, on your own, right? Uh, don't transfer the ah onto the rest of the guys, but ask for help. Say, look, guys, you know, I've got four things to do. This is standard work, yeah? I've got four things to do. They all have to be finished today. I don't know. You know, I'm not going to finish four of them. So, help? This is what you can do during the stand-up, right? Keep your work in the ticket tracker. I've literally told in uh, a company, Nimbus, when I was there, I've told the business side of the company, if you email my developers work, they can choose. They can read the email and think, oh, that's fun, they can do it, right? It's okay. Or if they read the email and think, oh, that sounds like a lot of work, they can delete the email. Don't have to respond, don't have to give any status updates. They can ignore it. If you want something done, you put it on the ticket tracker, we plan it, and then you're guaranteed to get it. Right? Email is either ignored or not. You will never know. That was really helpful in getting them to understand the ticket tracker. But it means it has to be clean, right? You can't have that email that's not in the ticket tracker, but you keep it there because you don't know if it's worthy of a ticket yet. Why are we having this conversation? Put it on the ticket tracker, even if it says analyze email such and such, to see if there's a ticket in it. Right? That too is a task. It is something you do. It takes you 15 minutes, an hour, to analyze fully what that email means. So it's work, i.e. needs to be on the ticket tracker. It's that simple. Right? And in personal life, it's not that simple because you don't have a ticket tracker with your wife. Um, and I wouldn't want to be the one introducing it. <laughs> but on work, in work, you do have it and you can close everything else off. As long as a team, you keep it squeaky clean and you put all your work there. And finally, if you do something, if you do sit down, 
You know, it doesn't take 10 minutes to put a little effort in cleaning the code, make sure it looks nice, checking there's no white space commit, check it, check it, checking, right? Take that time. I know it's hard, especially if I'm breathing now your neck going, oh, this needs to be done, needs to be done. Yeah, you know, but I tell it to my team like this. You're in development, right? There's a production incident. Everything is burning. So, woo, development has to fix it, right? By that time, first line is working on it. Second line is working on it. Third line is working on it. Development is working on it. One, two, three, four managers are working on it. We're looking 1,000 euro per hour, right? So take your time. You know, it's expensive. It's going to be slow anyway. Your development, you fix it good or you don't fix it at all, okay? So put everything in that one inbox, and this is when getting things done, especially when it's a personal feeling, that one inbox gets really, really important because it allows you to close off the rest of the world. Is it actionable, right? Some things that you get in Jira tickets, why do we use, do user stories? Because user stories are very clear. They're actionable, right? I need to do this. If they're vague, you know, make faster system. It's not actionable, right? Well, I know one action, which is to assign it to the product owner and go, um, you know, what? <laughs> is this even a sentence? So is it actionable? What's the next action? Make it simple for yourself, right? Jira has this comment box. You can put your own comments in there. And you can say, look, oh, what's the next action? Well, I need to do this. I need to do the right unit test. And then you can cross those things off in the text. You can do subtasks, which is really nasty. You can just use text. You can make checklists in there. Use the tools that you have, right? I do it on my phone. If I go to the grocery store and I buy something that's not on my list, I put it on my list. And then I cross it off immediately. You laugh, but it feels good, I can tell you. Yeah? The, the act of crossing off, closing an issue, creating that pull request, merging that pull request, Look for that cookie, right? Look for that feeling like it's done. Do it. If it's less than two minutes, do it now. Don't then check Facebook, right? Just do it. This is the hardest one, I can tell you. Less than two minutes. Okay. So, and I think this is a summary slide. One and only one to-do list. And, you know, for the team, too. Right? So this works on a personal level, works on a team level, even works on a company level. What's the company vision? It's not a bad question to ask, and don't be surprised about the answers. Don't do it on your own, right? You're not the only one overwhelmed, right? And it helps if there are other people who have that. Put your work in a ticket tracker and do one thing and do it well. And with that, you should find time to code. Thank you very much for your time. And if I